start. So I'm Grace. Good morning and good afternoon, depending where you are today. I am a dietitian based in Calgary, Alberta. Vancouver was my home for a very long time. Our family moved to Calgary over 10 years ago and have stayed here. My practice has been primarily in eating and feeding disorders after moving here since 2008. I started out mostly working with children, youth, and families. And in the past five to six years, my work has expanded to working with all ages. Because I was working with children and youth, I have developed an interest in RFID or other presentations that, that fit with uh, um, this umbrella since the DSM-4 time. And I really appreciate having this opportunity um, to work with Netic between the bulletin and this webinar. Um, these articles, uh, first one, Understanding RFID, a Developmental and Relational Perspective, and the second one, Responsive Feeding and Treatment Approaches, were published in the Netic Bulletin last year. Today's webinar's content is mostly based on these two articles. They were written by myself and Dr. Cardia Rowell. Some of you may know her as the feeding doctor. This is the outline for our webinar today. RFID is a huge topic. The diagnosis itself is diverse, and there's a lot of information to cover. We're only able to scratch the surface today. Also, because there are so many different types of presentations that fit under this diagnosis, we're not able to cover the details of how this may come up for different subtypes. For instance, someone with a very limited food repertoire versus someone who stopped eating after aversive experiences, let's say choking or vomiting. My hope is to make this condition less intimidating. If you have a patient or clients presenting with similar eating challenges, you feel comfortable in discussing and guiding your client in seeking help. We're going to spend some time discussing the diagnosis of RFID itself, moving on to discuss the, di the assessment process. Dr. Katia Rowell and I use a responsive approach to work with our clients and families, so we introduce the idea of responsive feeding therapy in the article. And we'll touch on it today, and we'll finish up with a case study. Given the time we have, I won't be able to speak to the differences in details on how we apply the principles to children, youth versus adults. You notice that there are more direct references to children and youth in our webinar today, but a lot of our discussion are relevant across ages. And if you work with adults, you may notice many would say eating um, has always been difficult uh, and has been challenging for a long time. So understanding those earlier eating experiences is important. Now, so let's start. So first, you probably know this already, but I'll go through that. Um, RFID stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. It was introduced to the DSM-5 in 2013. Because this diagnosis is fairly recent, we do not have as many existing guidelines or resources tailored specifically for RFID. There are more information coming out, even comparing now to last year when the bulletin came out. So I want to highlight the label or the name is new, but there are richest sources of information in the literature. When I talk to healthcare providers, many feel intimidated because they feel we don't know enough about RFID. And I recognize this is changing. More and more um, healthcare providers are becoming familiar with this diagnosis. If we look into the literature, actually, there are many clinicians and researchers outside of eating disorder professional community have been discussing exploring how do we support individuals and families with these eating and feeding challenges um, that now would fit under the umbrella of um, RFID. I've listed some here. And please note, this is not um, an exhaustive list. Uh, many of uh, are probably familiar with Dr. Irene Chateau. She is a psychiatrist who has been involved in treatment research and publications related to childhood feeding difficulties. You can find her work related, uh, sorry, you can find her work dated from um, back eight, uh, from the late 80s on non-organic uh, failure to thrive, food refusal. Then feeding disorder of infancy and early childhood was introduced to DSM-4 in 1994. A key difference between this and RFID is the age criteria. It required age of onset before six to qualify. And we can consider RFID was evolved from this diagnosis. And for a number of reasons, this diagnosis was not utilized often. The age criteria was one of the reasons. Identifying an age of onset can be confusing and challenging. And from which point on would you say the dysfunction reaches a clinical threshold? Sometimes identifying that can be difficult. And certainly the focus was on young children, so we left out youth and adults. Does highlight one of the challenges with describing feeding and eating difficulties in one diagnosis. These challenges are so diverse. How do we capture this very diverse group in one set of description? And here I highlight a few other classification, classification systems that are in the literature to describe these eating and feeding difficulties. Berkeley and colleagues, um, their work highlight that they're often mixed etiologies. Their work focus on both biological and behavioral factors. 
Laskin and Brian Walsh, they've written a lot on pediatric feeding disorder and eating disorders that work focused on the mental health and, and behavioral aspect. I will not go into all the details that I'll review in the, um, in the first issue um, of the two articles, and you can find the references in the articles as well. So when the DSM uh, was last updated, the feeding and eating disorders category were merged into um, one. The overarching theme in DSM-5 is using a lifespan approach to understand mental disorder. If we look at the second quote here, taking this lifespan perspective recognizes some types of feeding disturbance seen in young children persist into late, later childhood, adolescence, and even adulthood, or bear a strong similarity to eating disturbances that might have a later onset. So with these considerations, our fit would capture um, eating disturbances that are very different from eating disorder <clears throat> and now group together under this one overarching category of feeding and eating disorder. I highlight this rationale because our fit presentations may be similar to eating disorder that there seems to be a restriction, but the nature of the restriction is quite different. They are in the same diagnostic ca uh, category with eating disorder, but they're not necessarily similar to anorexia or bulimia. And many of us healthcare providers recognize that. But I find um, often when I talk to parents, they are alarmed or intimidated by the label of eating disorder. Um, patients or uh, parents often are at a loss with, what do I do now with this diagnosis? Um, but when we look closer at the nature of the eating or feeding disturbances, the etiology and presentations are different and distinct. And this also has implications on how we support these families and, and individuals. I believe we cannot directly apply eating disorder interventions to this group. The question that comes up often is whether ARFID is a feeding disorder or an eating disorder. So the point of merging the two categories is um, it's recognizing that there are many different types of eating or feeding disturbances. So it's not it's no longer about differentiating feeding versus eating disorder. It's to say um, this is one type of eating disturbance that we're now putting under the umbrella of eating and feeding disorder. And, and this is a big a bigger umbrella that we see there are many different types. Now, let's take a closer look at the diagnosis itself. Sometimes I get phone calls where people ask me, does this sound like ARFID? Or parents might bring this up in a medical appointment asking their providers or physicians, have you heard of this diagnosis before? I'm having a really, really hard time with um, feeding my, 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 my child or I'm having a hard time with eating. Do I or does my child have this condition? So I thought it might be helpful to actually look at what does ARFID really mean according to the DSM. And just like any diagnostic criteria, there are limitations and challenges, and I'll highlight a few today. First, let's look at this. First and foremost, it is an eating or feeding disturbance. That's the central core feature uh, of the condition. We'll skip the bracket for a minute. As manifested by persistent failure to meet nutritional or energy needs, this is meant to describe persistent concerns. So someone who has lost appetite for a temporary period of time and has significant weight loss, but resume regular eating after that would be different from what ARFID is meant to capture. And there are four ways to qualify for persistent eating and feeding disturbance. Weight loss, growth faltering. Growth faltering because in childhood and adolescence, when we're supposed to be growing, weight staying the same is also atypical. Nutrition deficiencies, depending on the uh, dependence on the use of supplement, as well as market interference with psychosocial functioning. One way to understand the diagnosis is persistent eating and feeding disturbance as shown by one of the four indicators. Though some have challenged this understanding because DSM specifically referenced to persistent failure to meet nutritional needs, and only three of the four criteria listed are nutrition related. Psychosocial functioning does not necessarily correlate with nutrition adequacy. But as it's worded right now, it is uh, if it's associated with one of the four, including psychosocial functioning, can qualify someone with ARFID. So this can be confusing. And with each of these four criteria, it relies on the clinician's discretion in deciding whether the presentation is significant enough or not. Uh, many have expressed the challenge of deciding what is the clinical threshold for diagnosing. For instance, Peter Schur, it's commonly used and marketed, not necessarily appropriately, but it's widely used as a supplement for children um, who may or may not need it. So how do we qualify whether a child is dependent on Peter Schur? Um, there are some natural fluctuations in growth patterns. So how do we, um, when do we become concerned a slowing down growth pattern is considered faltering growth? And for now, uh, we don't, uh, we don't have uh, concrete answers to these and we do rely on the individual professionals in answering these questions. Notice that there are three types of eating and feeding disturbance I mentioned. 
Um, there's some discussion about identifying subtypes as the diagnosis evolves. So it highlights RFID as a diagnosis and encompasses diverse presentations. Three different people may end up with the same diagnosis, but they struggle with eating for three different reasons. So there are some recurring patterns. The three described in the DSM now are low appetite, sensory avoidance or sensory sensitivities, and eating impacted by aversive experiences. So this is only my take. It's a visual way to illustrate my interpretation of the DSM diagnosis. Personally, I am inclined to interpret psychosocial functioning as a qualifying criteria. In my practice, I see many children, despite the eating challenges and psychosocial implications, are able to grow well without deficiencies, but the degree of dysfunction can be very significant. Social isolation, significant strain on family relationships, schools, etc. So I believe it is just as important um, as the other three concerns. And you notice that there often overlap. Persistent eating challenges will likely impact uh, more than one of the four criteria. That's why you see the overlapping circles here. I'm just going to take a sip of water. So the takeaway from reviewing the diagnosis and the relevant history is um, for us to take away is feeding and eating difficulties are diverse. They're difficult to, di to classify. The many previous attempts to understand these challenges Different systems have their pros and cons, hence a criteria have evolved over the years. ARPIT is our current diagnostic system in the DSM. The diagnosis is fairly new, but the presentations are not, and there's significant literature that we can reference to for those who are interested. DSM-5, um, it's meant to capture the significant eating and feeding disturbances. It's helpful to understand the limitations of the current diagnosis because um, you may run into these questions in practice and there aren't concrete answers at this point to some of these questions. Now that um, we have looked at uh, the diagnosis, for many of you working in the front line with clients and families, you may be wondering, well, now I know what the diagnosis means, but if someone shows up, if it fits, what do I do now what? And if it doesn't fit, but families are asking for help, what do I do? So for many seeking help, particularly in Canada, where our access to healthcare and insurance may not depend on a diagnosis, whether the diagnosis fits is only part of the picture. When, um, if they're seeking help, we know eating um, and feeding are stressful and not going well. So what is really important in the clinic room is to work with our clients to make sense of their challenges. What is stressing you right, uh, right, uh, right now? There used to be a belief if um, if someone is growing fine or their weight is stable, there's no concern. And we know that it's not true. At least it's stressful enough to bring them to us. So if the diagnosis applies on this part of the conversation, we can also help them to understand what does that mean. For many families I've heard from um, parents, uh, they find it validating to know uh, that what they're struggling with is beyond quote unquote typical. And, and having a label for it, for it can be supportive. Um, but then they're also lost with what to do, and, and often they feel uh, intimidated or overwhelmed by the idea of now receiving a diagnosis of feeding and eating disorder. So we need to help them to make sense of all of this information. So now while sitting with this, I want to direct our attention to this pyramid model proposed by Kirstner and colleagues. This is developed in the context of pediatrics, uh, but I think this model of understanding eating and feeding challenges really apply beyond childhood. Majority of the population will fall within the bottom part where feeding and eating is not a concern. As we move up the pyramid, there are varying degrees of eating and feeding challenges. If we think about ARFID being the significant ones, those are the ones who would fit on the top. And we may encounter many that don't fit exactly according to the DSM criteria. Or it might not feel right to give a diagnosis. For example, a feeding challenge that is very stressful but not persistent yet. Um, or we're not seeing the more, um, the very dysfunctional symptoms yet. It's good that we're identifying them early before it gets to that very dysfunctional state. And this is even more relevant for those of us in primary care settings. You may see many of those that may fit in the middle of the pyramid. These individuals and families need support just as much as those who are at the very top with feeding disorders. If we get them the support they need at the right time, the presentations may improve and don't deteriorate to the significant and persistent stage. So now I'm going to switch gears to assessment. How do I know where the family fits in that pyramid? How do I assess the degree of the eating disturbances? How do I know if it's significant? 
So most of what we cover would across uh, would apply across various degree of feeding and eating challenges. First, you know, we look at nutrition. Is this person adequately nourished from a nutrition from nutrient as well as energy perspective? This gives you a sense of the degree of malnutrition. How concerned do we need to be with nutrition uh, with nutrient and energy intake? Feeding and eating presentations. This informs us the degree of the dysfunction. For example, a child not feeding themselves at uh, um, at age of three would be something we pay attention to, but a school age child not able to eat at school because of anxiety, or this child not able to feed um, themselves, uh, you know, shows a very different degree of dysfunction. Um, I once had uh, worked with a family that um, the child was in the middle school. Um, and she couldn't eat uh, at school, so mom actually drive to the school parking lot every day, and and at lunch she'll go to the parking lot, and mom feed her in the car. And as you can imagine, that's a lot of stress on the entire family. Psychosocial concerns. So common themes include um, social isolations, any you know, do they avoid social situations, food related bullying. Remember the stress of the family and the parent child relationship is also part of the picture. For instance, if, fam if parents are avoiding to eat with the child because they're all stressed, um, that is a concern. Uh, so we're not just focusing on the psychosocial concerns of the child, we're also looking at the family system. Looking through these would give you a good idea where they are on the pyramid. And if it is important for you or the family to figure out diagnosis, say for a referral reason, looking through this list would, would um, help you to inform your decision. It's also important to look at historical information in your assessment. When I meet with adolescents and adults, it is not uncommon to hear that their challenges started very early on in life. Parents often would say, from day one, it's been difficult. The way we eat, um, how and where we eat evolve and change so much throughout the lifespan. The current information only give us part of that picture. Historical information also offer very important information, particularly important to look at transitions um, from milk to solids, when do they start feeding themselves, or school transitions, or moving and so on. Predisposing factor, it can be as early as labor and delivery. Um, for example, a very challenging birth with a difficult postpartum recovery for mom can have lasting impact on the feeding relationship. Reflux in babies, which are very, very common, may increase the risk of running into feeding problems and eventually evolve into eating disturbances. Um, even families moving, I've worked with a number of um, families and children, their, e their feeding challenges became very significant when they're moving or during immigration. They were staying with different families before they can settle into their own home, and children were young, even though they were doing their best, they were absolutely doing their very best, but they just couldn't implement some of the basic um, feeding practices because so many things were out of their control. Sickness, frequently in and out of hospital, so they can't settle in a routine. Any of these typical normal life situations can impact a child's um, eating experiences. Uh, we also then look at uh, feeding and eating presentations um, in the past. So I know we talked about we look at it for the current presentations, but we also need to look at what was it like in the past. Previous therapies or strategies that they had tried at home. Um, what did they try? Kissing the food, sticker charts, and so on. How did it go? Helpful or not? Um, it helps to identify things that they tried that were adaptive and things that they tried might not be helpful. It can help us to formulate and understand how the eating and feeding evolve into a persistent significant concern. I'll explain a little bit more with this example. Uh, for example, um, children with reflux can be very fussy to feed. Um, some parents discover that feeding them when they're half asleep or not very conscious is an effective way to feed them. It may work very well in infancy. But as the child grow, it may become less effective. It's much harder to feed a toddler in their sleep. Um, first, you know, they're more alert. Also, they don't sleep as frequently. So what was working is no longer working now. And in some cases, the child may develop um, bottle aversion as they grow older. Uh, or blending food, mixing a food that they're a non-preferred food with the accepted food. This may seem to work, you know, as long as the child doesn't notice it, but it may just take only that one time of noticing then they become cautious of the food that was previously not an issue. These are examples of strategies that might have worked in the past or worked in the short term, but not in the long term. As we gather more information, we start to get a picture of what are the various factors that might have contributed to the eating feeding challenges. You may be able to formulate the primary concerns or even identify the subtypes. A note here is, I don't mean that we need to put people in boxes of this person fits into this type and so on. Chances are you'll see a combination of subtypes and a combination of factors. Identifying them help to tailor our interventions. 
if we consider a child who has struggled eating since day one versus someone who stopped eating after choking or a child who is eating fine, um, but the appetite is severely impacted by medications. If the primary barriers to the eating are different, we need to tailor our interventions to address the respective barriers. When we're talking about historical information or understanding feeding history, sometimes this gets misunderstood as blaming or attributing fault. I want to address this because this is very important. This is Dr. Cardio Rowell's work, The Worry Cycle. We haven't discussed and don't, unfortunately don't have enough time today to discuss the role of pressure or how maladaptive feeding can backfire. But I want to clarify, understanding how environmental factors such as maladaptive feeding contribute to the current challenges is not about blaming. And we explain this in more details in our articles. Often there are very legitimate, very legitimate reasons for eating or feeding to become difficult. If you look at the cycle, it starts with the, with the child. Common issue like reflex, a child who is just naturally very sensitive to taste and texture, who just need a lot of time in introducing new foods, or some examples I listed earlier. Everyday, everyday life situation that we can all run into. When parents do not have those timely support and they see their child struggling to eat, it makes so much sense to do whatever works to get the food in. Feeding kids is a big part of parenting. And there are so many messages about feeding kids well, healthy eating. So parents want to do their best to feed children well. Without timely information and support, many would resort to maladaptive strategies. Because it seems to work, it works actually very well in the short term. Just that most don't realize what works in the short term may actually perpetuate the eating challenges down the road. But that's how the cycle spiral, as you can see this picture. I think about the butterfly effect, right? Something typical, typical and benign at a wrong time or inconvenient time, one thing leads to another, may just be enough to result in a lot of stress in eating. And I hope this clarify um, because we as healthcare providers need to walk with families, not walk against them. Now we're going to touch on interventions. Um, because individuals presenting with ARFID and the nature of their eating disturbances are so diverse, it is unlikely one type of therapy model protocol will fully address all types of eating disturbances. That's why we emphasize a key step to supporting individuals and families is to have a very thorough assessment and understanding the etiology, often layers of etiologies of the presenting concern. The treatment is then informed by what are the barriers to eating for this particular individual. What is the most important one to address first? And we advocate for a responsive approach versus using specific protocol. We introduce the concept of responsive feeding therapy in the second article. It is applying responsive feeding principles in the process of feeding interventions or therapy. It is not limited to one type of treatment or protocol. It encompasses a set of therapeutic tools that can be used in the process of therapy. When we refer to therapy, we do not mean um, just time spent with a feeding therapist. Most people think of feeding therapy as um, sensory food play or exposure therapy in the clinic room or oral motor exercises. Um, we think therapy is the entire process. And within that, it can include the work with a feeding therapist. But there are also other elements, say coaching parents how to support home eating, working with the caregivers, support systems, schools, and so on. The process of making changes to eating behaviors is very dynamic and there are many moving parts. That's why the treatment process needs to be flexible to respond to this dynamic nature. What I mean is, as we work to support eating and feeding, in one aspect, it may also open up other opportunities. Think about the Rubik's Cube. As you solve part of the puzzle, it changes the rest of the cube. As you can see in our case example later, um, I was working with this child uh, with poor appetite, anxious with eating, and limited food choices. As we start to focus on supporting appetite and reducing anxiety, the interest um, in eating came back slowly. So this opened up interest in exploring food naturally without explicitly working with food acceptance and variety. I want to acknowledge that right now there are a number of therapy types and models being investigated and researched. A few other models focus on changing behaviors, which differs from what I'm presenting today. Responsive feeding therapy is not a behavioral model. One of the theoretical underpinning is that we believe eating behaviors can gradually change, mature, grow with gentle facilitation. So I'm going to quote Jenny McLaughlin, an experienced feeding therapist. Um, she talks about from get to let. We don't have to get the person to where we want to see them. With gentle facilitation and support, we let the person moving along. 
The goal is the ongoing development towards developing eating competence. Some of you are probably familiar with this model, the eating competence model. The four elements are eating attitudes, and internal regulation, contextual skills, so think basic food skills, and food acceptance. We're not trying to teach a set of behaviors that we want to see. We're encouraging them to continually maturing their ability to eat and nourish themselves. This may include developing internal regulation, being able to eat enough to satiate at mealtimes, responding to their cues rather than external expectations, developing the necessary oral motor skills, sensory skills, food management skills like packing lunches, to social skills like eating in a food court. We believe changes are more sustainable when we let them develop in these skills with gentle facilitation. Step plus is the work of um, Dr. Katia Rowell and Jane McLaughlin, and some of you might know um, this from their book, uh, Helping Your Child with Extreme Picky Eating. We discussed how to apply this model in RV treatment in the bulletin article. Step plus is an example of responsive feeding therapy, but it's not the only tool. There are five steps in the process corresponding um, uh, there, and then each, with each step uh, of the process, there are corresponding principles and therapeutic goals. There's a sequence, and this is a, um, a sequence of steps, but it's not meant to be a rigid sequence. So I often use this as a guide when I work with families. Um, so if the concern is limited variety, often caregivers and their support system are ready to work on adding new foods or exposure right away, which fits better with steps um, three to five. I used um, the therapeutic goals to explain to, to um, the support system why we need to work on the earlier steps first, because these are our goals. And when we're moving away from maladaptive strategies, we're working on not doing certain things. And some people feel it's um, that the process is very passive. Uh, maybe we should be doing something instead of not doing something. So this is helpful. I can explain to the clients and families that we're certain we're working towards these goals, even though it seems like we're not doing anything. Um, there are benefits in not doing certain things in, in the therapy process. You'll see strengthening and supporting oral motor skills and sensory skills in step five there. So people often think about building these skills right away. So definitely, if applicable, that's definitely part of the process. But a little later, the earliest steps needs to pave the foundation for the skill building. Very briefly, I'm going to touch on feeding therapy, often refer to therapy time spent between the identified patients and a feeding therapist. Therapy that directly involves food can be very helpful, but it is unlikely that it would address the entire picture. It is not uncommon I hear from families that they refer for food school or feeding therapy. The child participates, but the presentation hasn't changed much. And so if we consider this, let's say sensory food play uh, is a very common um, type of feeding therapy. It may help the individual child to become more familiar with the food, but it doesn't address appetite or other concerns. So go back to etiology. It really depends on what, what are the barriers. I work with a child who is having a lot of fun in feeding therapy, but the nutrition and eating at home did not change. So during the assessment process, we found that this child has been spoon fed um, with electronic distractions at mealtimes and iPad. For a very long time. So the child was very disconnected from the eating experience during meal times. There has not been any discussion on how do we support home eating. So what happened was um, this family took their child to um, their primary care provider and the provider was great with, with um, hearing their concern and made a referral right away to a feeding therapist for sensory desensitization work. The child was initially not interested in exploring food, but has come, you know, become more comfortable playing the food, and there was progress in the therapy room. But the eating environment at home was not addressed at all. So our next step was then to come up with a plan um, in addressing other elements. In particular, in this uh, case, uh, we talked about how do we transition from using distractions to not using one? How do we transition from being fed to encouraging self-feeding? And, and, and this is not like, uh, this is not a toddler or a preschooler. This is actually an older child that was, was, um, and which is harder sometimes if we have to, um, change some of this. Um, if someone's been so used to being, um, fed up to school age, it's, uh, it takes a lot of transition to, to, um, go back to self-eating. When we're making referral or connecting client to a clinician, understand there's diversity within the area of feeding therapy. There are many different types, but even within the same training background, the style of the therapist or how the therapist implemented feeding therapy can look very different. When we're helping the family to figure out a plan, if hands-on therapy is required, finding the right fit at the right time is important. 
I want you to di I want to direct your attention to the two quotes in the slide. These are real life examples from parents. Um, so the first one, she held my son down and shoved food in his mouth for 45 minutes, causing him to scream, yak, and eventually to throw up. Being that I'm new to this whole process, I did not know how to react. This is um, a mom. Um, her her child was two year old um, when this happened, and um, this child has a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And this is a mom of a 10 month old child. I stopped taking my daughter to a feeding therapist after she forced food onto her mouth twice with her hands and several times with a spoon. And and they, at that point, there was actually already a, a, a spoon aversion identified. So both of them were appalled and eventually stopped going to the therapist where they had negative experience. And I, I should highlight this certainly does not represent all feeding therapists, but we do know that um, there are many different styles of feeding therapy. And, and um, so if you're making a referral, you may want to get to know your um, the person you're referring to. I also want to speak to the concern of using pressure or strong positive encouragement if an individual child or adult is not ready for a food exposure. We have evidence to suggest when a child is pressured to eat um, or try a food that increases discomfort or anxiety, even if the food was taken, it does not support the child accepting it in the future. So within a responsive framework, more exposure is not always better. So now we're going to go out. Now we're going to take a look at Michael, our case study. This is based on a real case um, with a few things changed. Um, though when we wrote up this case study, both Dr. Roel and I agree that this resembles many other families that we've worked with within our own practice. This is what we know based on the initial information. He was eight year old. Um, mom said eating has been hard since day one. Um, and he was recently diagnosed with the iron deficiency and he's only eating four foods right now. Gopher's crackers, dinner rolls, mac and cheese, grilled cheese sandwich. I wonder if you can think of anyone that you've worked with that might resemble um, Michael's presentation. So this is what we know based on this. All right. Um, there is a persistent feeding and eating disturbance um, since day one. Limited diet variety, only four foods. Nutritional deficiency, um, iron deficiency. And then there's very likely caregiver stress. If mom is saying eating has been hard since day one, it's very likely that this has been a very stressful experience for her for the past eight years. What else do we want to know? Is he meeting energy needs? Is there a growth concern? How's his weight doing? Um, is there a strain on feeding relationship? What's the impact on psychosocial functioning? This is what we found out in our um, assessment. Uh, the predisposing factors. He was naturally a small baby. And um, so there was a lot of uh, focus and emphasis on making sure this child grow well because he is small. Um, he also naturally has a sensitive temperament. Besides uh, food, he's also sensitive to sound, to fabric, and and also um, feelings, uh, other people's feelings. So if, um, if the child sees that other people around them are upset, you know, the child's actually get impacted more. Uh, feeding history, because there was so much pressure or worried about around his size, um, pairing with a, where they were in a lot of stress, um, about making sure he's fed well and he was growing well. And that in turn became, um, a pressured, uh, experience. So they often, they in, uh, inadvertently try to pressure their child eating more. Um, and then the transition to solids in the toddler use was very slow and very stressful. The only very few accepted foods as he transitioned from, from milk to solids. By the time school age and preschool school age, um, parents have tried everything. They've exhausted their options. Coaxing, rewards, sticker charts, consequences. And eating became very, um, the eating experience was very negative. It was very hard for them. And eventually they stopped eating together because it was just so much stress and it was impacting too much on their relationship. He was in feeding therapy for six months uh, when he was in preschool. Um, the, the therapy was sensory based, so um, touching, kissing, and licking the food. Um, but he really um, did not like that. There was a lot of crying, and um, he was not a happy camper there. All right. This is um, how the current eating looked like. Um, there's no structured eating time. So after school, he come home from school. He doesn't really eat a lot in school. And then when he comes home, he's he's hungry. So he started um, snacking or grazing. By the time dinner time comes, he, he really um, isn't quite hungry. Um, but then after dinner, he might uh, grab a couple snacks. And some days there are activities. Some days there, um, there isn't. Um, and on the days that there are no activities, everyone um, 
still eat at their own time. Um, there are four of them um, in the family. So he has a sister and parents. Parents acknowledge that they don't enjoy eat, um, gathering around food anymore. It's just easier if everyone does their own thing. He, um, in terms of uh, psychosocial functioning, he avoids social uh, any social situations that require eating. He feel quite actually feel quite embarrassed about it, um, eating around people. He's also in sports. I did not um, uh, include that here, but um, he's also involved in sports, and that was starting to impact his sports uh, performance. He was talking about feeling really tired, and 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 he didn't quite enjoy sports any as much as before. All right. So after meeting with them, this is what we did. So I went through um, uh, the model, and we taught. We work on the first set of interventions. First, we establish a consistent eating routine. So remember, he was grazing. We're trying to move away from the grazing, having structured time, um, so that he can actually get to experience maybe feeling a little hungry in between, and so that he's ready for the snack or the meal. We want to make sure that there's accepted foods at every eating opportunity. So he's eating. There's a couple things that he could eat every time he comes to the table. We also work on this continuing pressuring cues. So there was definitely confrontation or um, a lot of um, pressuring to make sure that he eats because it's such a it's such a worry for such a long time. So we worked on those those few things for the first six months. Um, and if you remember the step plus model, this is the first two, two step: reducing stress and anxiety and consistent eating routine. And after that, we worked on the second set of recommendations. So I mentioned this, the first set was about six months, and then we worked on the second set of recommendations over another few visits. As part of the intervention, I routinely review progress with individuals and families. I remind them progress may seem very, very slow. Let's say in this case, child coming to the table without coaxing is indeed a huge step. Many families dread meal times, or as parent, as soon as parents said it's dinner time, the child will run into the room. So coming to the table without um, a lot of effort, even though it may seem like a small thing, or there may not be a lot of changes to the food, it actually is a huge progress. Next, we address positive pressure. It is actually a very common shift for families to move from the more confrontational approaches to gentler or nicer approaches. Uh, uh, for example, verbal prompt. I need you to just take one bite. You have to swallow this. Um, while this may work for some families with a milder presentation, this often doesn't work for the persistent cases. The positive prompts can be experienced as pressure because they still have to face what they're not ready to do yet. So in this case, um, we heard from the family that um, they stopped all negative cues, but they were consistently using encouragement to get um, Michael to try new things, which didn't work so well for them. Next, we also looked at family meals. Family meals can be a very supportive eating experience if the focus can be taken off the food. But family needs a lot, a lot of support in making this happen. So please note, um, this does not mean like seven days a week. Family meals every day is indeed quite challenging for most families. Uh, for those of you who are parents um, uh, um, in the room, uh, you will understand this. So we discuss, you know, how often and when is realistic, what to prepare. Meal planning can be um, very stressful. How do we include the child's food repertoire and still allow the family to eat as usual? I spend a lot of time um, discussing this in details with um, usually mom, um, whoever who, who, who does the cooking, uh, the meal planning at home, uh, sometimes dad too. What would a meal look like? Um, and so we actually, we might actually sit down and actually do a five days menu so that this feels doable and practical. Um, next is neutral exposure. Being around novel foods, notice um, their parents eating um, the food, but without any expectations for them to try. Exposure is a common strategy used for eating challenges. Eating together with others is a gentle approach to exposure compared to setting feeding therapy goals in a clinic room. And we hear it all the time. They try new food when they're least expected, when nobody's watching. Um, low stress eating experience with others can work really well uh, as um, gentle exposure. So these are our second set of recommendations. So how did this case unfold? So for the first six months, um, he was less anxious, definitely. He came to the table without coaxing. Um, we, remember, we worked on those meals and snacks time. So so he, he was having, he's starting to eat snacks and meals at the consistent times, and he would come, and, and it was much less stressful uh, for, uh, for mom to get him to the table. They start eating together as a family two to three weeks, two to three times a week. There was no change to his diet. The significant change was reduced anxiety at the table. Then we work on the second set of recommendations. Um, so after another three to four months, um, he was continued to be more relaxed at meal times, notably less anxious at the table. 
everyone was paying less attention to food and definitely Michael was paying less attention to the food. He started eating bigger portions um, without cooking, without prompting. He just started naturally eating bigger portions. His growth trajectory even increased a few percentile. Um, variety was about saying he did try a number of a few things. If you remember, he was eating the poor foods and he started um, he, and he would eat grillfish crackers, but no other crackers. So by this time, he started to try a few things. And it's not like he would eat it regularly, but he was open to trying a few different types of crackers. And families actually talked about it was actually nice that now that they get to see each other at dinner time. So they are enjoying family meals for the first time. Um, so as you notice, there are some changes to the food and pairing up also pleased with a lot of these changes. Um, but the lack of difference in variety was still discouraging for them. Um, but they were great. Um, they were troopers and um, we continue with the same um, feeding plan. And after a few more months and around six, uh, around 14 months from assessment, he started adding more bread items. So besides toast or bread, he started eating wrap, um, other types of bread items, bagels, um, pancakes. Occasionally, he he would try different things. And remember, he's trying. He's not he's not quite eating these foods consistently. But the difference is, he's now willing to try new things. He had to actually try a few bites of strawberries. He started eating chicken nuggets, um, the breading. So he was eating around the chicken nuggets. And then by 18 months, he started eating small bites of meatballs, hamburger patty. So he was not eating, you know, a huge portion, but there was definitely interest. And he was eating as he was not just trying. He eat like little, very small bites of um, meatballs and hamburger patty. And then we also start looking at the different types of food that he um, he started eating more consistently. Remember, he started with four foods. By 18 months, he was um, actually eating over um, 15 foods. And if you remember, he had iron deficiency. That's what uh, one of the concerns that brought him, um, you know, to to work with someone. Iron rich foods took a long time to add to his diet. So throughout this time, um, he was taking iron supplements. So there was no pressure to get him to eat the iron rich foods. So that pressure can be taken off, and and family can be re can be um, assured that even though the progress to add meat types or iron rich foods are slow, it will not impact um, his nutrition status because we were supplementing. And supplements would still be required until dietary sources of iron became consistent. And practically often, um, there is a titration process. As they start eating more, we can actually uh, maybe able to lower from like a treatment dose of iron supplements to a maintenance dose of um, a supplement, more like a, like a preventative dose. So this person, this patient in real life, we stopped working together at around 18 months. Mom felt good about the plan. She knows that they still need to continue with the plan, um, but she really feels like she knows how to problem solve around the issue. Um, Michael was more confident with social eating. He was no longer tied in sports. This likely was, you know, um, credits go to um, the iron supplements and probably getting more calories. No more follow-up was required. So um, both both mom and child, they were actually both happy. So. And then, so then we stopped working together at that point. So this um, br uh, brings us to the end of this case study, as well as my presentation. But I hope the case study kind of pull together some of the information I explained to you earlier. Uh, before I finish, I want to quickly acknowledge this wonderful team working together. The Netic team has been fabulous, and Ari has been great, you know, with helping me along with some of the technical difficulties. Um, Dr. Kari Rowell, it's been uh, it's been wonderful to work with her, and we had a couple colleagues, Jenny McLaughlin and. Stephanie Brooks in giving us uh, feedback and reviews um, when we worked on this project. I want to finish with this puzzle slide, acknowledging that we're still in the development stage of building better care and therapy models to address feeding and eating disturbances. We have some of the puzzle pieces, not all of them yet, but I believe this will improve with the work and interest in the professional community, as well as the advocacy of parents and individuals living with this condition. While there's more work that needs to be done, I want to offer hope and assurance that we actually have some of these pieces of information to offer to our clients um, so their quality of life can be better. So now uh, we can take some questions and here's my contact for anyone who is interested in getting in touch. And Ari, I'm thinking I'm actually going to switch the mic. I think it could be the mic. My other mic might a little bit, may work a little bit better so that I can hear you. So I'm going to try that um, and then I'm going to just uh, hand the time back to you for a minute. Hello everyone, um, Ari again on the webcam which you can see and hopefully hear me okay. 
Um, we, we did get and we were thrilled by the amount of questions that we received in the pre question period. Um, and I have sent them to Grace and we're going to go through um, the couple that she feels comfortable asking once she uh, once we have her hearing us properly. <laughs> can you hear me, Ari? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. All right. So let me now take a look at the question. Um, has any link been, is that where the question, has any link been uncovered regarding concussion leading to arthritis? Mm -hmm. um, that, I, that I don't know. Um, I would, um, I'm thinking, I would not be surprised if there, there could be. Um, again, goes back to, I, um, lots of medical conditions can be connected to arthritis, but I can't say for sure. Um, uh, whether there has been any link proven, but as I explained earlier, so many things, benign or major things could, um, you know, could lead to arthritis. I work with, um, a couple families diagnosed with, um, EOE, um, you know, which is a very severe allergy and a, a very, um, you know, concerning medical condition. And because of some of the symptoms, you know, it can lead to, um, eating difficulties. So I could see that there's a connection. Um, so I don't know if that addresses that question. Let's see. The next one. How should practitioners who want to begin working in the space get started? Are there additional training resources that you can suggest? Um, there are, um, actually there are some, there, there are some in the works and, um, and as I mentioned, there are a number of different, um, therapy models being developed right now. Um, there are, um, there was, uh, FBT, there's CBT, and now I, along with a network of colleagues, are trying to further develop this responsive feeding therapy model. So there are lots coming up. And if there's interest, I can definitely keep Ari up to date with uh, some of the responsive feeding therapy work that's going on in the future. Yeah, we'll make sure um, if we hear anything from Grace on this lens to um, promote via social media, we may host another webinar on this topic if there is interest. And we will be sending out a feedback form after this so you can indicate if this is a topic you want to hear more about. Um, we're happy to accommodate if that's what the community is asking for. Um, who can diagnose ARFID? Can dietitians? Um, I think this goes back to a diagnostic question. So dietitians cannot, uh, we, we do not do DSM diagnosis. But what I often do practically is, um, because we have the time, like I, I am a dietitian, so I, I often meet with clients for 60, 75 minutes and often in the first appointment, sometimes even 90 minutes. So I get a lot of details of this information and then I go back to the provider who may not have time but who can diagnose in explaining these are the things I am noticing. I I would look at those um, the criteria and give them the information so that um, the respective providers can um, can decide if the diagnosis fits. How do you manage to help expand foods without adding anxiety? Would the anxiety medicine help uh, for a while while we introduce new foods? Um, so I think I mentioned in the presentation um, how we could do it um, gently. And again, this, this goes back to there are different, um, different philosophies. There are certain therapy models I mentioned that are more behavioral focused. And my belief is sometimes when they're not ready, then it will add to the anxiety. So that's why I believe uh, if we work with a responsive feeding approach, the anxiety is much slower, and, and the process might be much, um, maybe much longer, but it's more sustainable. And if we actually look into the feeding literature, if we look into feeding research, some of the models that show evidence that um, certain therapy models may work in adding new foods, those are really short term. Like some of those studies are three months, six months, maybe the longer ones are 12 or 18 months. We're not looking at one year, five years, you know, post-treatment. And as we all know, eating is, you know, something that we do for now our entire life. So if we do a set of, um, of interventions and someone starts eating more food after three months, but that is stressful and they eventually stop doing that, that's not helpful. And, and that's what, you know, we hear from, uh, from parents, right? We tried everything. It works for short term, but then it doesn't. So I, and that's why, um, I, along with some of uh, my colleagues in, in developing these, uh, this responsive feeding model is we believe that it's better to work patiently and, and to help the person to, to, um, move along and have sustainable changes. Yes, do have a lot of questions. I'm excited to see this enthusiasm. 
with co-occurring body dysmorphic disorder, how my clinician support habits around eating? Um, this is a very broad question. And you know what? Um, for the person who asked this question, if I can invite you, um, I will put my contact um, my contact email on the slide again. And feel free to contact me. I think there are, um, as I explained earlier, um, ARFIT is such an um, overarching, like it's, it's such a diverse presentation. There's so many nuances within there. So with this person, um, I think it's helpful to really look at, um, uh, to really look at what, what are the concerns and what are the ideologies? How has this eating become so difficult? And then slowly work with that. Um, and I would comment on this, um, again, body dysmorphic disorder is very broad. Uh, I would say I have worked with a lot of people who, who have become very sad or shameful around body size, particularly being small. Um, so it is something that I hear, um, I hear from clients and I find often um, normalizing what they're struggling and ha really helping them along and giving them a lot of assurance that this is not your fault. This is not something bad. Uh, I actually find a lot of my um, clients, they find it very reassuring when I tell them there are lots of people who struggle with this. Um, many people don't realize that they actually think that they, they are a very odd person. They might be the only person in the universe with this condition. And, and that's when I tell them, you know what? I actually do this um, most of my time. I don't work with other things. I don't work with diabetes. I don't work with heart conditions. I just do this and, um, and it keeps me busy. So just to help them to understand that they're not alone, um, sometimes really take away some of that, uh, some of that shame around the body. But if I don't, if I did not address this question more thoroughly, please, you're welcome to contact me. Can you give us an estimate of how many visits would be typical to start to see a return to more healthy eating pattern? Um, how does long-term follow-up look like? Um, this really depends, and it really depends on how long um, uh, eating has been challenging. So if we work with a child um, at age two or three, um, we may be able to reset a lot of those things and get the family you know, in a uh, back on track um, within a shorter time. But if I work with, let's say, someone 14 or 15, it may um, take a much longer time. But it also depends on the resources a family has. Um, some of the families I work with, they're also juggling multiple therapeutic um, um, priorities. Uh, a lot of families, let's say, on the autism spectrum, they have a lot on their plate. So they might not be able to address eating right away. So the big picture often also determines, again, um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't I don't mean to be vague, but truly, there. Um, it, 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 it just it depends so much on the situation. Before you hit the next one, Grace, um, I will say we probably only have time for one more question. So there's a couple that one that Grace can choose from there um, to folks who okay. asked questions that we didn't get to. Um, you're more than happy to contact myself and my emails in the other chat or just by responding to one of these webinar emails. Um, and Grace has kindly offered her contact information on the slides that will be sent out to everyone post webinar. Um, so please contact us if you have more questions and if we can do our best to help or refer, um, we're more than happy to do so. But go ahead, Chris. Okay. Yeah. So there's last question is how does um, speech language pathology or OT evaluation fit into the assessment that I can do as a dietitian? If I suspect there's a swallowing or an anatomy challenge, how do I go about pursuing that as a private practice provider? That's a very good question. Um, I find... I describe my role actually when I work with these families more like a case manager initially as a private practice provider. I do a very thorough assessment and then sometimes there are cues that will cue me into thinking there might be a concern that I should involve an, an occupational therapist or speech pathologist. So I, my suggestion would be if you're a sole provider, you may want to see if there's anyone um, in your area that who, who share an interest or who is experienced in this and talk to them about their approaches and see if it fits. And and you might, you know, um, sometimes I will just go and talk to someone and say, does this sound like someone who may benefit from uh, from your work and, and developing that relationship? And some, some may fit, some may not. And I also often um, put it back to the, to the family. Uh, um, one of the things I find sometimes, remember, go back to the steps model. By the time we get to um, the step four and five, some families could actually go and work with an OT to do some of the um, uh, uh, sensory skills work. I actually put it back to the, uh, the family. 
some of the family actually would say, yes, we would love to. And some would say, you know what, that's actually going really well. I, I just don't want to overwhelm my child with all these appointments, um, particularly if children also have multiple appointments. So some families you may choose not to. And so I, I do work with them to decide if that fits. So I guess that would be our last question, Ari. And I will just put um, my contact here again. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much to Grace on behalf of NEDIC um, and on behalf of the community here. Our fit is something that we have heard about um, on our helpline, on our instant chat service when we go out into the community. And it's why um, my colleague Emily um, commissioned Grace to come up with two bulletins for it, which you all will get resent again in this webinar. Um, again, we will be sending a, a survey. And if this is something you would like to hear more of, please don't hesitate to let us know. Um, and we hope to see you again in our next Netic webinar on in April, which we will be tackling orthorexia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.